For the message this evening, I would like for us to, we did read the passage uh, again, but I would like to just go through the first eight verses here, and then uh, we want to focus primarily on, on verse 8. But uh, in the book of Micah, uh, in the previous chapter, uh, we see in verses 14 and 15 in uh, chapter 5 that the Lord has a controversy with the people of Judah. And that controversy was their idolatry. Uh, they worshipped in the groves. They had idolatrous worship uh, in the groves and in the mountains. And rather than using those places as places of worshiping of the true God, they set it up as uh, places to uh, worship their idols. And God says in verse 15, uh, God will take vengeance upon uh, idolaters. And we see in verse 15 of the previous chapter, God says, And I will execute vengeance and anger and fury upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. Now, uh, the people of God in, in Judah, uh, they were finding the displeasure of God uh, upon them. And as I said, because of their sin. Although they had some of the greatest prophets, Isaiah and uh, Micah at this particular time, uh, they just didn't get it. That it was un dealt with sin, and particularly idolatry. They thought that by going through their ceremonial uh, worship, that, that that would be pleasing to God. And it was even stated here, Lord, should we offer in sacrifice our, our own child? Would that uh, appease your wrath against us? And so there are several things I'd like for us to note here, uh, and I'll point those out, but just quick review of the preceding verses we see in verses 1 and 2, that uh, God then declares this uh, controversy with his people uh, in Micah's time. And yet they seem to be oblivious to it in verses 1 and 2. Hear ye now what the Lord saith. Arise. Now, uh, I, my version says contend, but it means uh, plead thou before the mountains and let the, the hills Hear thy voice. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy. And ye, strong foundations of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with his people, and he will plead, that is, uh, he will, it's, that word plead actually has a sense of a legal contest. They're uh, breaching the judgment of God and his law because of, of their idolatry. Now, he mentions here about uh, the mountains uh, being a witness and also the hills. Now, what does he mean by that? He's talking about these are the places where they had so much idolatry spread into the mountains and in the hills. And he's, God says, they are testimony against you. It's like they're being brought into a court of law. And the testimony, the witnesses here uh, are the places where they committed adultery, idolatry, which is spiritual adultery. And then we note in, in verse 3 that God then vindicates himself. You know, it seems that when people fall upon hard times, they, they begin to say, oh, what is the Lord doing to us? And if they don't think about, well, maybe it's something they're doing. Uh, they want uh, to put it on the Lord. And um, we note uh, in verse 3, then the scripture says, O my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Why are you turning to idols? They had good prophets telling them the truth. They did not receive it because they would rather continue on in the idolatry. Uh, that was so rampant as you read in the book of Kings and the Chronicles. Uh, and so God pleads with them, uh, what have I done unto thee? 
And uh, wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. Now, the Lord then, uh, in verses 4 and 5, uh, shows that he has been good to them. They have nothing uh, of which they uh, can bring a charge against the Lord. And the Lord reminds them of uh, the time when they came out of Egypt. In verse 4, For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of servants, and I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And so God, God is pointing out to them, I have not done evil against you. I have done good. I have led you out of Egypt, and I have given you Moses and Aaron and Miriam as leaders that led you out of that land. And then also, uh, we have the Lord also uh, stating his case that he, this is God's testimony against them, and showing his goodness to them. He says, oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted. Remember, uh, Balak uh, wanted to curse the children, was told by, uh, yeah, Balak wanted to curse the children of Israel. And every time uh, the curse was to be spoken, out came a blessing. God made them speak a blessing. And so we see uh, what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered uh, when he was told to put a curse upon the children of Israel. Rather than the curse, he spoke a blessing. And so we see again the goodness of the Lord. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the Most High? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Now here again, the uh, children of Israel looked at the ceremonial law as uh, having some efficacy of reconciling them to God. And uh, God is telling them, it's not about your sacrifices. Uh, it's about your sin. And so he says, uh, the uh, word there used, most high God, that is uh, uh, Elohim. That word means the, the supreme God. They had all of these idols, but Israel's or Judah's God was the true God, the supreme God, Elohim. And they were saying, well, shall we offer more burnt offerings? Uh, shall we bring off more calves uh, to the sacrifices? But then the Lord's answer is, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? And, and you know, some people these days do the very same thing. Uh, they will be in a sin, unrepentant. And then they think by uh, coming and doing good things and coming into uh, the worship service like other people who are coming here to worship God, that somehow uh, there, that, that just cancels the evil uh, that they are doing. And they're not really dealing with the sin. And so uh, this plea of Judah then uh, comes up in verse 8 about God tells them, he has showed thee, O man, what is good. I want us to note four things in this verse. First, I want us to note that they wanted to even, as I mentioned earlier, sacrifice the firstborn, thinking that would uh, alleviate or placate the wrath of God. But God says, you have been shown the thing that is good. And what is that? They had been told the divine revelation of God, what God's will was for them to do. And so I titled this message with these people in this uh, dilemma and crisis that they are in. 
They're asking, what does the Lord require? And the Lord tells us. We can go throughout all the scriptures and the scriptures tell us what the Lord requires of us. And the first thing I would have is to note that what God would require of us. And that is that we would uh, learn from God's word the good way. That is why it is so important, and we emphasize reading the Scriptures. We emphasize being under the teaching of the Word of God. Anytime you can have an opportunity for the teaching or hearing of God's Word, it would be well to be under that, the sound of that Word and then take notes, take that message with you, and pray for God to give you grace to live that life out throughout the week. Now, Judah did not lack knowledge concerning the right way. Read through the book of Isaiah. Uh, we have the great revelation there given uh, to Isaiah as to their sin. And Isaiah tells them very plainly. And, and this is the same generation. We have Micah, Isaiah, and Hosea. They were three contemporaries uh, at the time prophesying uh, unto uh, Judah. And go to the word of God. That is the place where you will find the good way. What is the good way? He hath showed thee, God has, O oh man. Now, God speaks as, to Israel as one person. He has showed thee, O oh man, what uh, is good. And the thing that is good is what God has revealed in his word. Every issue that we have in life has the remedy given to us in the Word of God. And so the prophets did not withhold. They spoke boldly and clearly to the sin of the people of their time. But the problem is, as it was with the Lord Jesus when he was ministering, rather than receive that word, they rather hated that the messenger because they didn't like the message. They didn't like the message, and they hated the messenger. Now, if we face faithfully, then practice the good that is revealed in God's word, we are promised blessing. Listen to Revelation chapter one, verse three: "Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy." And keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now note, it didn't say just read. Now sometimes we can read the scriptures very cursorily and not really get the sense or depth of what uh, the scripture is saying. Yes, we are to read it, but to hear it means to understand it. And if you have to take a, a few moments to really get clear in your mind what the Word of God is saying, take those moments. Don't just pass over a passage until you, you have some grasp of what the Lord is saying. This is God speaking to you. You know, we have people today uh, saying they have visions and revelations, and God came to them in the middle of the night and, and uh, were at the foot of their bed and gave them some revelation. We know that God speaks to us through His Word. And we all have such access to it, like I was saying earlier. It's a blessing that we have. We live in such a... In this technological age, we ought to thank God that we have such access, uh, not only to the Word of God, but also to uh, many uh, Bible helps. Uh, and we can do some really in-depth study. Uh, study the Word of God. But note, it says, don't under, not only read it and understand it, but keep it. Do it. Keep the things that are written in this Word, and you will be blessed. Now, these people were crying out. Uh, the misery in the, in the throes of their uh, suffering because of their sin, unrepentant idolatry. We find in Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, God declaring to us from His Word that the Word of God will bless those, the whole life of those who hear it who walk in it. 
Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But the man that is blessed, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So we find also in Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11, wherewithal shall a man cleanse his way? You know, really, when it comes right down to it, uh, a lot of the problems and difficulties that come upon us come upon us because of sin and uh, unrepentant sin. I'm not saying always, but uh, sometimes that's the case. Uh, and so it'd be good to uh, do some, some heart searching, some soul searching. For we find in Psalm 119, the scripture says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according unto thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. May that be our prayer this evening. Seeking the Lord in his word. Being steadfast in these commandments that he has revealed in his word. And then the psalmist says, Thy word have I hid in my heart. And uh, I take that to mean perhaps uh, memorization. Meditating it. Memorization. Get the word in your heart that I might not sin against thee. You remember how that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was tempted, of course, he was the Son of God, and uh, he uh, could call Scripture uh, very easily. Some of our recalls, maybe not uh, what we'd like it to be. But, you know, the more you study it, the more you'll be able to recall, the, and the more you memorize Scripture, the more you'll be able to recall Scripture. So, yeah, commit it to memory. That's one thing that we've kind of left out, even in our schooling uh, is memorization. I know a few generations back, the, there was a lot of memorization in school. And uh, memorization is good, especially memorization of Scripture. What would happen if, if you didn't, if you got in a situation where you didn't have a Bible and you were uh, left without any Scripture? And so memorize it and embed that word in your heart by memorizing it. And walk according to that word. So dear Christian, if you would see the goodness of God. Uh, that would bring lasting joy unto your soul. Then by grace, you must understand it. Apply it to your life. And we should ask ourselves honestly and sincerely. Do I read? Do I meditate? Do I practice the word of God? On a daily basis. I want us to notice secondly. In this verse 8. As it asks the question. What doth the Lord require? It requires of us. It says. To do justly. The Hebrew word here has two senses. In which doing justly can be understood. Of course. Uh, first. Uh, to do righteously. That is to live your life according to the Ten Commandments. We should all have the law of God memorized. Uh, again, uh, that way it, it embeds it in our hearts and, and we can reflect on that. You know, when, as I was going to say, <laughs> as Christ was tempted, uh, he was calling up Scripture and it was uh, through that scripture uh, that he put the devil to flight. And uh, we are to do the same. But God wants us to do justly. Uh, we read about some of the examples uh, in the scriptures. I think of Job as a, as a just man. This man, uh, he had everything taken from him. He was plagued with boils. And uh, he went through a horrible, horrible experience, but yet he had his faith steadfast uh, in 
the Lord, and he did what was right. You know, when some people began to uh, go through some difficult experiences, they began to do things that they ordinarily wouldn't do, things that are not good. Not so with Job, because uh, it says uh, of Job, and the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man? That's, he was one that did justly. One that feareth God, escheweth evil. Now, that's a word we don't use all that much, but it means you turn away from it. You don't go headlong into it. You turn away from it. You see evil coming. Uh, we're out on the highway and we see an accident about to happen with another person. Uh, you do all that you can to try to adjust the situation so that you do not uh, have an accident. So we will have incursions with our adversary, the devil. And the scripture is very clear about that. Or the adversary goes about his roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And uh, so uh, we are to have the whole armor of God. And when we see that evil coming, uh, pray God that he will enable us uh, to put that spiritual armor to work. Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in earth, a perfect and an upright one, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And we see uh, righteous uh, Abraham as well. Genesis 18, 19. God says, for I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. That's what it means to do justly. To do justice and judgment. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. There's a second way in which we can understand to do justly. And that is if we see those who are being treated unjustly. That we ought to do what we can uh, to help resolve the problem that one may not uh, be abused in that way. Isaiah 1.16, Isaiah spoke uh, to uh, the unjust treatment of others. Wash you, he says, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. You know, when we do evil, think about it, we did it before the eyes of God. Reminds me of a, a man that did a prison ministry and uh, he said that he was uh, talking to a young man that had gotten converted and uh, he was in prison for stealing. And he said, you know, when I stole, he said, I looked this way, I looked that way, I looked behind me, I looked in front of me. But he said, I didn't look up. And uh, he didn't, in other words, did not take thought that God was seeing exactly what he was doing. And so we are to put away the evil of our doings. God sees those things. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. That's what it means to do justly. And then we note, uh, thirdly, not only we must be in the word of God and that will show us the thing that is good. That's where God reveals to us what that which is good to do justly. But also to love mercy. Uh, mercy is something whereby we take pity upon others. One of the most profound examples of pity uh, that we have is, is when the Lord Jesus Christ uh, was being crucified on the cross, he said to those who were putting him to death, Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. I mean, they do not know what, the, for they know not what they do. And then they parted his raiment and cast lots. And so we have Jesus loving mercy, not just 
to friends. It's easy to show mercy to people that are kind to you. But we are to show mercy even to our enemies. Love your enemies, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ tells us. But further, we see here in verse 8, what further does the Lord require of you? And, and when I say you, I'm using that editorially. I mean all of us. What does he require of us? To do that which is good, to, to justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before our God. The walk that the scripture speaks about is our conduct. And God takes note of our conduct. And we read of uh, Enoch. He walked with God. Now this walk uh, was a walk of, of communion with God. And it was, it says, he pleased God in all of his ways. And here God has left us these examples uh, that we might aspire by his grace to also uh, do like Enoch. Walking with God, being in communion with God, and loving Him and obeying Him. If we would be humble then before God, we must understand God's Word and obey that Word. In Numbers 10, 12, God reveals to us the humble person. And now, Israel, what does the Lord require of thee? This is a humble person. Fear the Lord thy God. Walk in all His ways. Love God. Serve Him. Serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all our, our soul. You know, God has given us a life. It's a, it's a blessed thing to, to have life. And uh, we begin to appreciate life more as we get older. Um, we also uh, appreciate life if we know that you know, death is imminent. But for all of us, regardless of what age we are, uh, we ought to uh, want to walk as God would have us to walk, and that is to walk with humility. I know that we all desire to see God bringing uh, a great visitation of His Spirit in uh, calling many uh, to salvation. And uh, regularly in our bulletin, I, I like to put that passage that's so familiar to us, Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves... And pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, I know all of us love our country. But we'd like to see this land healed. God's the only one that can heal us. And so we need to pray that uh, God would grant that uh, he would have mercy uh, upon us. And humble us. You know, it is the humble person that is the type of person that people like to, to be around. It's the type of person that is uh, self-denying uh, and wanting to care for others, not so much as for themselves. And we see a good example I've always been reading of this in 2 Chronicles 34, 27 of King Josiah. I think of one who really knew what it meant to walk humbly before God. King Josiah, as you know, he was one that uh, at a very young age he wanted to see uh, reformation being brought about. And uh, he was very zealous for the things of the Lord. As you know, uh, he was a young man that went out to war and, and uh, he, was, he died in battle. But he was a, a great king while he was a king. But God looked on his heart 
And, and as we read the scriptures, we see that God looks on men's heart. And that tells us that he looks on our heart as well. And God said to King Josiah, because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God, when thou heardest his words against this place, God had pronounced judgment against uh, Judah and against the inhabitants thereof. And he humbled himself. And he did rend his clothes. He was so distraught with the state of things not going in the direction in a righteous way. He just tore his clothes with just such uh, anguish of heart. He did rend his clothes and wept before God. And God said, I have even heard thee also. I've heard you. God heard Josiah and God blessed him. In Proverbs 29, 23, in this matter of uh, humility, this scripture says, a man's pride shall bring him low. You know, a person that is proud, they want to be on top. Uh, but uh, the scripture says, if that's what the person aspires to out of pride, they will be brought low. They will get the exact opposite uh, that they want. But honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. I know all of us, as we hear these things, can see where we can improve in, in our own life and sanctification by the grace of God. But remember, in James 4, 6, it is God who must give us the grace to do these things. He giveth more grace. I love those words. James 4, 6. God gives more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that the Lord may richly bless you with uh, his abundant grace. And, and I, I pray that uh, God will give us all uh, grace to see what good God has given to us in his word. Help us to see that we need to be just in all of our acts, actions and to take pity upon others. That's what mercy is. It's taking pity on others and also walking humbly before the Lord. And so the question before us this evening is what will best obtain our heart's desire. Israel wanted things to be good between them and God. But they weren't willing to give up their idolatry. And God says, I can take you to the hills, I can take you to the mountains, and they will testify to me. You may have done that in secret, but they will testify to me what you did here. they on the outside, they, they seem to be crying out to God for help, for deliverance uh, from their torment. But they really did not, in their hearts, want to do what was right. Judah was plainly taught by the prophets what they needed to do. You read through the book of Isaiah, and uh, it's a very lengthy book, but it's, it's well worth sitting down and reading it all the way through, and you can see how wicked the people were, and, and yet some of the most glorious prophecies come from the book of Isaiah. I think it was said by someone that um, the book of Isaiah was probably the most quoted book by our Lord in His earthly ministry, if you go to uh, the Gospels. And so the consequence then of disobedience is misery. And this was Judah's cry. The misery. They didn't like 
the misery. Going to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 58, verse 1, um, God told Isaiah, don't spare, you need to tell the children of Israel what they're doing wrong. Cry out aloud, Isaiah 58, verse 1 and following. Spare not, lift up the voice, lift your voice up like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. It seems that we're living in a time when some of the preaching is just like dancing around sin. They don't want to bring that up. It makes people uncomfortable. But the prophets were bold, and they spoke as God told them to speak. Now, so if Israel really wants to please God, it's not going to be by all these sacrifices. It's not going to be even by sacrificing uh, your own child. They must learn to do right. And verse 8 tells us what is right. And God further speaks through the prophet Isaiah. uh, This prophecy, verse 2 of chapter 58. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Now, you would say, this sounds like a very spiritual congregation. (laughs) Wherefore, have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore, have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? And then, as you read on in Isaiah 58, you find out that they weren't listening to the prophet. And they weren't doing what the prophet told them to do. They just were continuing on doing what was comfortable for them, but not really dealing with their sin. And so what does the Lord require of us? To follow his word, to do justly, to show mercy, to walk humbly before our God. And so we see, by the grace of God, we ought to follow that example That is laid out for us in Psalm 1. Again, this would be a good psalm to memorize if you haven't already. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. And this shows us an example, and I'm ending here with an example of one who knows what it is to live right. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. (coughs) That bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whithersoever, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. This really is what God requires of us. May God give us grace to be faithful to the good word uh, that he has revealed to us here tonight. Amen.